Thank you all so much for coming out this afternoon. I hope you've enjoyed this uh, morning's discussions and the debate and the TED Talks and the like. Um, so normally at the Pacific Council, we actively try to avoid looking at issues through a political lens so that we can focus on the policies and their implications and whatnot. Uh, but today in this conversation, we're actually all about politics, um, really trying to get into the nuts and bolts of it. Um, and this is, as I'm sure everyone in the room is fully aware, a particularly interesting moment to be having this conversation, because uh, we're in a moment where it feels like foreign policy and politics are intertwined in a way that is uncomfortable, um, to say the least. So later this afternoon, um, our final event will actually be a discussion of Ukraine. So I don't want to dwell on that too much right now. Um, but there are a whole host of issues right now globally that have the potential to really impact the lives of Americans. You know, um, China's rise as a military and economic power in a way that could potentially upend what has been the, the global power structure since the end of the Cold War. Uh, global leaders trying to figure out how to grapple with climate change, or at least some of them trying to figure out how to grapple with climate change. Um, a contest over influence in the Gulf uh, that has uprooted millions of people and caused enormous amounts of suffering, cyber technologies that have really fundamentally changed how we think about national security and our own um, livelihoods. Uh, but the question we want to address right now is not so much um, what the policy responses to those things should be, but whether those issues actually impact how voters think about who they're going to support um, when they enter the voting booth on election day. So for those of you I have not met, um, I'm Thomas Zimmerman. I'm the director of programs uh, here at the Pacific Council. And before fleeing to the sunny shores of the West Coast, um, I spent most of my career sort of bouncing back and forth between electoral politics and government. Um, I worked in the Pentagon and at the White House and the National Security Council um, on the Obama administration. And then I also have worked on a number of presidential campaigns, including overseeing foreign policy and national security research for the 2012 reelect. Uh, and one thing that has been a um, very stark divide is, is how different the issues that sort of dominate your day um, when you're working in government how different they are from the issues that tend to overtake the campaign trail and what people actually talk about. And so one of the things we want to sort of dig into today is why that is. Like, why is there that divergence and what is driving that? Um, joining me in this conversation today, uh, we have two amazing gets for panelists, um, if I do say so. Uh, Anna Kasparian is the host and executive producer of the award-winning series, The Young Turks. Um, which is the world's largest daily online news show. She also is the host of No Filter. Um, Anna's contributed to MSNBC. She's written for the New York Times. And she has been covering American politics uh, for much of her career and provides a really interesting perspective today in that um, she has insights into the ways that uh, the media helps to drive some of these narratives, what is influencing that, and the way that the conversation between candidates, campaigns, and the press um, often influence the conversations voters are having. Um, just to her left is Bob Shrum. Bob is a renowned political strategist. Um, he has a storied career in democratic politics. Uh, he was a speechwriter for Senator George McGovern, senior advisor on the 2000 Gore and 2004 Kerry campaign. Uh, more locally, he actually worked on uh, Tom Bradley's uh, run for mayor of LA and then has also done international work uh, including um, working with Ehud Barak in Israel and Gordon Brown in the UK. Um, one thing I did want to acknowledge at the outset here is who is not currently on this panel. Um, you may have noticed there's nobody providing a uh, Republican experience perspective. Uh, that was not intentional. Um, unfortunately, the planned speaker we had was unable to join us. But the goal of this discussion is not to really talk about um, which policy prescriptions are right uh, the merits of different arguments. What we really want to look at is um, how, do, how do international events shape domestic politics? Um, what influence do global events and international developments have on the way that we talk about politics and the way we vote? And then also, what influence do domestic politics have on the way that our elected officials approach their foreign affairs uh, platforms? 
Um, so with that, um, I'm going to turn this over to our panelists for a couple opening remarks. And then we're going to have a little bit of a conversation, and we will open it up to uh, questions after that. So Anna, if you'd like to go. Sure. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, and thank you for this wonderful event. I love that we have a forum where we can talk about some of the more pressing matters that I think get neglected in some of the media coverage that we're experiencing today. So just to give you a little sense of my background and where I've really stood when it comes to foreign policy, I remember in 2003, right before we invaded Iraq in this preemptive war, I was in 11th grade. I'm now a 33-year-old woman, and I remember being in English class. I was supposed to be reading along with the classroom. I don't even remember which book it was. But hidden inside my book was an article about this inevitable war. And I remember reading about Bill Crystal. And Bill Crystal was specifically pushing for that preemptive war in Iraq. And I just remember feeling hopeless, helpless, frustrated, because even as this little 11th grader in an English class, I knew that we were about to make a huge mistake. But I felt like I was being gaslit. I felt like I was the only one who really understood what was going on. And now, of course, hindsight 2020, I realize more and more people were really against it, but they felt as though they couldn't speak out about you know, their skepticism about weapons of mass destruction, their skepticism or their worry of creating this precedent for preemptive wars. And now I like hearing that people are a little more skeptical, openly skeptical in questioning whether it makes sense to take any military action against any country, Iran being one of them. That's certainly in the news quite a bit these days. And so these types of conversations are important and there might be differences of opinion, but the whole purpose of learning history is so we don't repeat the same mistakes. And I hope that we learn from some of the mistakes that the U.S. has made in the past. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I have to apologize. I'm in the 11th or 12th day of a bad cold. So if I have a coughing fit in the middle of this, I'm not contagious or I wouldn't be here. I talked to the doctor. Uh, and my voice is also a little scratchy. Uh, First, I want to say, by the way, and it's, it's an obvious point, but it's really important. Uh, people debate a lot whether or not foreign policy has a big impact on politics. But there's no question politics, raw politics quite often, has a huge impact on foreign policy. I mean, just think about what's happened on trade and the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, think about what's happened with Iran and the Iran Agreement. Uh, immigration, which is now rolling through Central America and distorting our entire policy process down there, the Paris Accords. So that's true. But I want to go to the central question that was asked here. How does foreign policy impact politics, especially elections? There is a kind of economic determinist theory about elections that says it's all the economy. If the economy is doing fine, then the incumbent party is going to win. Uh, foreign policy is just not that big a deal. I think that is utterly ahistorical. Uh, in 1952, the central promise of Dwight Eisenhower's campaign was, I shall go to Korea. The economy was actually doing pretty well, but people were very, very frustrated by the Korean War. In 1960, uh, Richard Nixon was running on experience counts. They had signs all over the country, experience counts. Uh, <coughs> and it was a reference to national security. And what was critical in that first debate was that JFK crossed the threshold where people could see him as experienced enough. I think it's a threshold issue. It's not, a, it's not a, 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 an edge issue. It's a threshold issue. If you cross the threshold, it doesn't matter if somebody has more experience. Uh, Ronald Reagan had to do the same thing in a different way in 1980 in that debate with Jimmy Carter. He had to reassure voters that he wasn't trigger happy. Uh, 1968, foreign policy had a profound impact. The Vietnam War drove Lyndon Johnson, who only four years before had won the biggest victory uh, in terms of popular vote in American history, and one of the biggest uh, electoral vote victories, out of the process of even seeking the Democratic nomination for president. Uh, after the fall of the Soviet Union, we kind of had a lull in foreign policy issues until 9-11. Uh, in fact, I think you could argue that it would have been very difficult 
in a time of intense Cold War uh, for Bill Clinton, for example, to ever have been elected president because he had no foreign policy background at all. Uh, <coughs> but then came 9-11. And if you look at 2004, uh, I think foreign policy, particularly the threat of terrorism, was a decisive issue. Uh, I don't know how many of you remember it, but on the Friday before the election, Osa there were Osama bin Laden released a tape, or Al Jazeera released a tape, and Osama bin Laden we had very uncomplimentary things to say about George Bush. Now, he was no dummy. He understood that that was going to help Bush, not hurt Bush. And at the same time, a Republican super PAC in Ohio had a brilliant ad on uh, with a little girl whose mother had been killed on 9-11 and who'd met Bush and he'd embraced her. And uh, I was deeply involved in that campaign. I would argue that that confluence of events was decisive in Ohio, which decided the election. Now, up until this point this year in the Democratic debates, for example, we've heard very little about foreign policy. The looming question, the overwhelming question, was Trump's fitness for office. But now, suddenly, that question, his fitness for office, it's merged with foreign policy, if not in the conventional sense. Uh, the president's apparent use of his powers abroad for domestic political campaign purposes, uh, the Ukraine, and if that wasn't enough, he decided to impeach himself in public yesterday morning by, by saying, yeah, let's, you know, I, I want China to investigate Biden too. And he keeps talking about, you know, the no quid pro quo. I think there is evidence of quid pro quo. It doesn't matter. It is still illegal, and it is certainly fits the definition of a high crime and misdemeanor to ask a foreign power to intervene in our elections. So we are going to be talking about this, debating it, all through whatever impeachment process we go through, and then the presidential campaign. I think one of the president's problems, by the way, is that he, he, he runs the presidency a certain way. Uh, uh, Ted Kennedy, for whom I worked and then consulted for 40 years and who was one of my closest friends, once told me that his brother, uh, John Kennedy, when he was president, had said to him, you know, one of the things if you're in this job is you got to have three or four people around who are allowed to tell you when you're being a dumb SOB and you have to reward them, not punish them. I think if anybody dares tell this president that something he's doing is dumb, they're out the door. And you can look at the list of casualties uh, in, in the last couple of years. Uh, so we're, we're going to be talking a lot about Ukraine, impeachment, foreign interference in elections. And we're going to be doing it. I don't know if you've noticed the last couple of days. There's much less coverage of the campaign, which is actually bad for the candidates who are down there at 4 and 5 percent uh, and tends to freeze the race with the top three candidates, uh, maybe the top four. Uh, <coughs> finally, there will be other major issues that can break into this campaign with big impact at any point. North Korea is one. Uh, Iran is another. I agree, absolutely, there's just tremendous resistance with, at, at the idea of military intervention. I think Trump instinctively understands that, which is why John Bolton lasted very briefly as national security advisor. Uh, and I think global warming, uh, or I guess we have to call it climate change now, although the globe is warming, uh, that will be a big factor, I think, in driving turnout, especially among young people uh, in the election. Uh, and of course, the fallout of the trade war in all sorts of uh, Midwest states that Trump needs, I think will have a big impact. Uh, fundamentally, my bottom line would be to say we're in uncharted territory with an unprecedented president uh, and drawing a line now, a division between domestic issues and foreign ones may in this election prove to be impossible. Well, one thing that was really interesting in, in the number of the examples you just provided is that the, the issues that broke through were all ones where it connected with a existent narrative around the candidate, right? You think about... Um, Reagan being potentially trigger happy or um, the current president's fitness for office. And then you, you also saw it in 2012 uh, when it played out in the, the sort of blowback around Benghazi um, and uh, accusations that the, the 
that President Obama was not doing enough to provide the support our our people needed, right? So there's there are existing narratives, and it feels like in many of these, um, when there's an intersection of that narrative and whatever is happening globally, it really just sort of strikes a chord. So what what is it re what is required for an issue to really break through and to kind of dominate the coverage in the way that um, <laughs> the examples you've given and the current example do? Well, it, it has to be something that voters really care about. I always mm -hmm. say to people that candidates think they can decide what the election's about. No, the voters decide what the election's about. And you've got to meet the voters where they are. I don't mean you have to pander to them, although some people do, but you've got to meet the voters where they are. You've got to talk about the things they care about. Uh, you can't say this election is about interest rates when if people don't care about interest rates, if they're not worried about interest rates. Uh, but I would, I would suggest that sometimes it doesn't work out quite the way a candidate thinks it will. Uh, so Benghazi was, uh, for, for Romney going into that second debate, uh, that was the bomb that was gonna, gonna blow up Obama. Instead, it blew up Romney. I don't know if you all recall, but uh, uh, the president, uh, President Obama, said something and, you know, about Benghazi and took responsibility. And then Romney got up and said, uh, "You didn't call it terrorism uh, uh, for two weeks." And then he looked at Obama and said, "You didn't, did you?" And Obama, with great self-confidence, says, "Proceed, Governor." And he keeps talking. And then Candy Crowley, who was the moderator, interrupts and says, uh, "But he did call it terrorism." Uh, Governor Romney called it terrorism in the White House Rose Garden the day after the attack. Well, I mean, you never heard the word Benghazi again from Mitt Romney. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have to be careful how you handle these issues, because if you handle them wrong, they're going to blow up in your face. But as I say, all of those rules, they're interesting examples. They may tell us, a, a, they tell us a lot about the past. They're probably going to tell us a lot about the future. This year is going to be unique in so many ways, I can't even begin to enumerate all of them. Yeah. You know, I'd, I'd like to add uh, to that answer about what it is that would break through to voters. And, you know, in the media, you end up having some predictions. You know, there'll be this big news story and you think, oh, Americans are going to care about this. But there were a few shocking events that transpired over the last year that Americans didn't really seem to care too much about. So I wanted to give at least one example. And that's the example of the Saudi crown prince ordering the murder of a U.S. resident, Jamal Khashoggi. Jamal Khashoggi was not only a U.S. resident, he was a journalist for the Washington Post. He went to Turkey uh, and was planning on getting married, so he went to uh, the embassy in Turkey, and that was where he was murdered. And there's overwhelming evidence indicating that Saudi Arabia was behind the order of his murder. Well, he was murdered in the Saudi Arabian embassy. That's right. So I bring that up because he, here you have... I, I remember during the 2016 election, there was so much anger on the Republican side about US, the U.S. involvement with Saudi Arabia. And by the way, that wasn't frustration that was unique to Republicans. I mean, Democratic voters felt the same way. And so I thought, all right, well, this is finally forcing U.S. representatives, members of Congress, to have a very important discussion about the relationship that the United States has with Saudi Arabia. And what I was amazed by was the fact that Donald Trump was able to sit there and literally say, we are going to continue on with the sell of weapons to Saudi Arabia because they help us out economically. Big business, big money. That's that, And I think really that is the heart of some of the foreign policy decisions that have been made over the last uh, several decades. And the I think the economic situation for a lot of Americans does play a role in whether or not they care about foreign policy. Because when we see our taxpayer dollars, when American voters see their taxpayer dollars going toward helping Saudi Arabia with their genocide in Yemen, rather than actually helping Americans with health care or, you know, infrastructure improvements, all of those things that Americans really want, they get frustrated and that does push them out to vote. I think it's all interconnected. They might not cite foreign policy as their, you know, determining factor for who they vote for or why they vote. But I do think, you know, at least subconsciously, 
they do realize, you know, there's way too much of our resources going toward some of these terrible foreign policy decisions when we should be taking care of our own. So as a result, I, I notice that on the Democratic side, there's a lot of emphasis on candidates who are not hawkish on foreign policy. I mean, Tulsi Gabbard is polling at like 2%. I, I totally get that. But she's running on a campaign that only focuses on, I'm against war. Now, she doesn't really give specifics and just says, I'm against regime change war. And that hasn't really garnered much attention. However, I've noticed that there's a growing worry toward one of the front runners, and that's Elizabeth Warren, because she's not focusing on foreign policy enough. Where is she with foreign policy? What is she planning on doing? So you see a growing number of progressives who are like, we love that you have a plan for this. We love that you have a plan for all these wonderful domestic policies. But what are you going to do when it comes to our situation with Saudi Arabia? What are you going to do when it comes to the Iran nuclear deal? Are you going to be as you know, supportive of some of the behavior that's happening right now with the Israeli government. I mean, you see these questions coming up, and I think that there's a desire to address a, address them, but there is a failure, in my opinion, on the media's behalf in giving these issues the proper attention they deserve. So then related to that, what if there's a obvious tie between what gets coverage and what voters are asking questions about in town halls and on the trail... What is driving that coverage? Because, I mean, the, the Khashoggi murder got a, a decent amount of coverage at the time, and then it kind of tapered off. Um, and these things are obviously not happening in a vacuum. What kind of, what determines what will break out in that context in a way that does have legs? Yeah, I, I, uh, first, I would say uh, I disagree with, with Anna a little bit. Uh, I do think there's an economic interest in uh, getting along with Saudi Arabia, uh, and she's right about that. But I think she may have been too kind. I think it may be a very direct uh, and personal interest on the part of the President of the United States. Oh, I was implying in, that. In <laughs> Sorry. In Sorry along. if I wasn't clear it, enough. It wasn't just about weapon sales. Yeah. Uh, I think what happened there more than anything else was, uh, and now you're going to take me straight into domestic politics and I'm going to try to be analytical, uh, with the increasing, if... Some people criticize it as belated. I think, you know, you should welcome converts, exception of Mitt Romney. Uh, there's been almost no criticism of the president during this Ukraine mess. In fact, there have been the, the people who've gone off to, to give a kind of reflex defense. Uh, there is a lot of reluctance for mainstream people to go on television, for example, and defend him. So that's why Devin Nunes is on Fox every night, uh, because... They can't get a lot of people. But I think what happened with Khashoggi is that Republicans felt they had to take their cue from the president. And that's a, that reflects a deeper reality than any foreign policy issue. <coughs> uh, if you look at Jeff Flake, if you look at a, any of a number of people around the country, Bob Corker, chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee up until a year and a half ago or a year ago, uh, and uh, Mark Sanford, uh, former governor of South Carolina, congressman who, who the Democrats now hold that seat for the first time in, I think, 50 years or something because the president intervened at the last minute and saw to it that Sanford was defeated in his primary and the Democrat won the seat. So I think that even when they disagree with the president, even when they like to have this vigorous debate about Saudi Arabia, uh, and I think a lot of people, uh, you know, I, I think a lot of Republicans even would, in the Senate, for example, in the House, <coughs> they're not going to do it because they're afraid they're going to get primary. They're afraid the president's going to come out against them. Well, what one, you know, California is a wonderful case study for what could happen and I hope doesn't happen to the Republican Party nationally because we need two governing parties in this country. Because uh, sometimes one party's going to lose and the other's going to take over. Uh, in 1994, uh, when Proposition 187 was on the ballot and Pete Wilson was running uh, far behind Kathleen Brown in the governor's race, he used Prop 187, the anti-immigrant proposition, said if you were here uh, and you were undocumented, your kids couldn't go to school, you couldn't go to the hospital, etc. He used it as a lever. Uh, to, to win that race. And he did win the race. 
proposition was declared unconstitutional, and Latinos decided in this state that they were Democrats. Uh, and this has now become the most, in my view, close to the most solidly blue state in the country. Before that, people forget this. Up until 1990, people wrote about the Republican lock on the Electoral College, which could not be broken because they controlled California. So the real question is whether or not, uh, and I know I've gotten far afield of foreign policy here, but I think it relates. The question here is whether or not you get a smaller Republican Party that's very Trumpist and and leaves even most mainstream Republicans. I mean, Mitt Romney get reelected in, in Utah no matter what he did. Uh, uh, leaves a lot of these guys feeling, and a lot of these women feeling, there aren't that many of women, uh, feeling that they can't say anything, that they can't have the debate over Saudi Arabia because the president would be furious. Well, pushing back on that a little bit, though, I mean, I understand why incumbent Republicans are not necessarily going to come at the president and that political reality at the moment, but you don't hear Democratic candidates raising it on the stump much either. Um, it's not just a protecting the president. They don't seem to see uh, a political upside to raising this on a regular basis. So why That's because that? Democrats tried for, I mean, there was a lot of effort by uh, people in the Congress, Democrats in the Congress, to make an issue of Khashoggi, to make an issue of Yemen, to make an issue of Saudi Arabia, and it didn't seem to resonate. And what happens in campaigns, as I said, the candidates try to meet the voters where they are. They try to talk about the things the voters want to talk about. Oh. And I think Anne is absolutely right. I thought this would be a really big issue. Mm -hmm. And my, my, my depressing explanation for it, uh, leaving aside the Khashoggi uh, aspect of it and, and talking about Yemen, is that maybe Americans just don't mind that much if it's a proxy war. If somehow or other we're hoping to finance a proxy war, but American kids aren't getting killed. Well, I think that, so I agree with both of you to some extent, because I believe that there has been a failure on behalf of Democrats when it comes to messaging clearly why this is an issue. I think that it's an unfortunate truth that most Americans won't be invested unless they see their own losing their lives as a result of what's going on uh, with either military <laughs> intervention or our involvement in a proxy war. But one thing that does get people fired up is taking a good hard look at their own economic instability and realizing that the money that should be helping our own goes toward getting involved in these types of wars. So I think that it's important to talk about, you know, how this hurts Americans economically, what matters to them the most. And I think that this is true of any other, you know, political campaign or strategy. I think that we focus far too much on the things that we disagree on rather than what the electorate does agree on. And if you look at just the distaste that Americans have right now toward any type of military intervention, I think that gives you an idea of how you can clearly message that, hey, maybe fighting in these proxy wars doesn't make sense. Maybe being so supportive of what Saudi Arabia does doesn't make much sense. And more importantly, I mean, whenever these discussions are had, and it, I feel like Democrats don't message this clearly either. Whenever there are discussions about, let's say, and this was big prior to the 2016 election, radical Islamic terrorism, right? It always, that conversation always stops at, oh, it's because of their ideology. It's because of their religion. No, but what pushed them to such an extreme place? How did our foreign policy play a role? And I guess that's a very controversial thing to say. But when you're using drone strikes and signature strikes that wipe out huge civilian populations, yeah, that's going to create perpetual war. And that's going to cost a lot of money. And we really need to rethink why we're pushing ahead with these incredibly flawed foreign policy strategies, right? So... That messaging is clear, it's honest, and unfortunately, we don't get that type of messaging from you Democrats. Won't. You won't. I, I think, I think we, we won't because there's a lot not of money one. behind the decisions no. they make. There no. is. If, if a Democratic candidate got up and said, we have to understand how our foreign policy contributed to 9-11 and radical Islamic terrorism, they might as well get out of the race. They would just be rejected. And you know how they'd be rejected? Democratic primary voters would reject them because they say, that person can't possibly get elected. Uh, 
So, look, there's only so much space that people have in their heads and only so much air time. Uh, most people don't spend as much time as we're spending this afternoon talking about these issues. They got to they got to get the kids to school. They got to cook. They have two jobs. I mean, all of that. And what's happened now, and I think you may have been right about Saudi Arabia should have become a big issue, and I think there are a number of reasons it didn't that we talked about. But right now, Ukraine and to some extent China and impeachment and a president whose name most Americans never heard of a week ago uh, in Kiev, that's filling the air, and there's not a lot of room for something else. But I, I would... I, I would, I'm trying to be analytical and not, not argue a, a, a point. I can just tell you, as someone who used to advise campaigns, I would certainly not advise anyone to say what you said. Mm -hmm. I think it would be a big problem. Uh, and I think there's a reason Tulsi Gabbard is at 2% and a reason that she will stay at 2%. Well, look, I, I disagree for a number of reasons. And I think that the messaging matters, and messaging is repetitive, both in the media and by our politicians. So the messaging that the American electorate has gotten over and over and over again, and there's this ridiculous consensus, is that, oh, well, our foreign policy is in jeopardy, our, our national security is in jeopardy, because these are bad people, right? These are just bad people, they're inherently bad, we're not doing anything wrong. But what if we change the messaging to what the reality is, right? Because... Imagine our adversary, whatever country you want to choose, decides to do a drone strike in California and they wipe out an entire family that's at a wedding. Are, are we going to fight back? Would we want to fight back? I think we all agree we'd fight back, right? Because that's our national security in jeopardy. And so I get it. It might be politically unpopular in the beginning, but the biggest issue I think for a lot of voters and I think you're underestimating the amount of voters who are paying attention who, and who know what's going on. No, they're paying that, attention, but they can't the pay attention to everything. No, I get it. But they do pay attention to these decisions because they want to know where their money's going. I mean, we all see how much of our taxes, you know, get contributed to things that actually don't benefit us. So I just think that there's been this consensus that has pushed this country toward war over and over again. And now people are getting fed up with it. There's a reason why... Donald Trump called off that airstrike in Iran. He called it off because it was politically unpopular to do any type of military intervention in Iran. He knows that it's going to hurt him politically. I mean, Tucker Carlson, of all people, did a lengthy segment urging him to avoid any military intervention because he knew it would hurt him politically. Americans are sick of these interventionist wars. They're sick of regime change wars. And I think that they're being underestimated in regard to how much they're paying attention and how much they know. I would, I would question, though, you know, that there's been a sort of conventional wisdom for decades that, you know, you are politically rewarded for being hawkish. Right. And so there's there was a, an effort for a while for Democrats to show that they could be tough enough and that they were strong enough. But you've sort of seen a flip in the perceived political advantage that Republicans have on the issue. Kerry outperformed Bush on that. Uh, Clinton outperformed Trump, although I realize there's an interesting dynamic there in terms of who was considered more hawkish. But the the, the assumed preference towards um uh, a, a demonstrated willingness to sort of stand up seems to have pivoted. And it'd be interesting to think about why that is the case. Um, is it, you know, obviously we're in a very different place than we were in the immediate aftermath of 9-11. So has the political calculus on that shifted in a meaningful way? Yeah, yeah. We, 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 we went into a war in Iraq on the basis of either misinformation or lies. I mean, you... I don't want to, but there were no weapons of mass destruction. And the rationales we were given turned out not to be true. You can have your own judgment about whether that information was manipulated or whether somehow or other our intelligence systems failed. And, you know, so the, 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 the piece of cake, the cakewalk, turned out to be a quagmire. And people hated it. And by 2006, in the midterm elections, the Republicans got brutally punished because of that, combined with the effects of, of Hurricane Katrina. Uh, so I agree totally with Anna that, that 
there's a tremendous aversion among the public right now to wars of choice, uh, wars for regime change. Uh, and I don't see any serious Democratic candidate for president who's in favor of those things. Uh, and I don't think they could get nominated. I don't think a Democrat could get nominated who was in favor of that kind of, 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 of national security policy. And um, you know, I've been highly critical of a lot of American foreign policy over the years. But I also think that it's still true that people at the bottom line say to themselves, can I trust that person to protect, <laughs> to protect me in a world which is often dangerous? And if you don't pass that test, you're going to have a big problem. And I think Democratic primary voters who are desperate to beat Trump, I mean, it is a driving, driving motivation right now. We'll look at the candidates, and if somebody looks like they might not pass that test, they'll tend to turn away from that person. Uh, and, but, but what changed all of this was, was, was Iraq. I mean, look, we could have had a whole different th thing after 9-11. I mean, we could have gone, and this is what I think Al Gore would have done if he was president, uh, we could have gone into Afghanistan, which I think we had to do, but not to stay and not to create a whole new country. I mean, the only person who's ever successfully conquered the place was Alexander the Great, and, and he died shortly afterwards, so we don't know how it would have gone long term. Uh, uh, but go in there with massive force, get Osama bin Laden, don't do deals with the warlords who were playing with both sides, and certainly don't do a war in Iraq. I mean, when we were working on Gore's acceptance speech in 2000, I had stuck a line in there uh, that echoed a line he had used in 1992 uh, when he was running for vice president. I have a message for Saddam Hussein. It is time for him to go. And Gore took a pencil or a pen and drew a line right through it and said, I am not going to say that. You know, we're, we're not going to a war with Iraq. And I think that he wouldn't have gone to war with Iraq. I think we would have gone into Afghanistan. Then we would have left Afghanistan. And it would have been a shambles. But guess what? We've been there 17 years, and it's a shambles. Uh, so it's, you're, that's what changed everything. The, the, the experience of actually spending $3 trillion, losing all these troops, killing all these people, uh, that's what's changed things. And on the bad side of it, it's what's led people, bad side in terms of what Anna was talking about, it's what led people to say, yeah, relying on drones is a good idea because it's not going to get American kids killed. Yeah, I, I don't want to talk about Yemen. You know, it, it, the, the Saudis are doing that. Maybe we're giving them some money and some arms. But it's not, doesn't rise to the top of their level of consciousness. Now, <coughs> something could happen. There could be an attack of some kind on the U.S. That would change the, the, the political landscape of this year. There could be an intervention. John Bolton could have had his way, and we could have ended up in a conflict with Iran. That would then become a dominant issue this year. <coughs> I think the president right now, people tell you I can be wrong, maybe incredibly wrong, but I think he's sort of paralyzed in terms of foreign policy right now. I don't think that he can afford to do an Iran, not just because of the resistance that the country would have, but because of the mess he's in uh, over Ukraine. And I think there's going to be more and more stuff coming out. And by the way, I think there are going to be, there's going to be stuff coming out where he has had conversations with the president of China saying, will you please look into Biden? He took up $1.5 billion. Nobody knows where he got this number. I know where he got it. Where did he, he get tell us? He got it from a book written by a conspiracy theorist. Yeah, okay in 2018. I'm not even kidding. Because that's what this administration is about, but we're not going to get into that. Um, I do want to add something uh, to, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think our failures in both Afghanistan and Iraq really do serve as, as the primary examples for why Americans are distrustful toward politicians who try to push us toward more uh, war. And I mean, if you just recall what the debates look like in 2016, Donald Trump was savvy in campaigning in that he kept mentioning how Hillary Clinton voted in favor of invading Iraq. And it was a very successful strategy. That's all he needed to do. I mean, he was never specific about what he would do in foreign policy. He never was 
he never had a single specific policy idea on the campaign trail, period. But that very simple messaging of, you voted for this war that we're still involved in, it was a failure, we wasted our resources on that, that worked. Um, so I agree with you on that. But I do want to add a few other things that I think are relevant to the conversation. So luckily with the internet, I mean, it really has democratized information. Um, now, it has also been co-opted by bad actors, as we know, with, you know, the emergence of fake news and all that. But one thing that I've noticed is that Americans don't simply rely on mainstream media narratives of what's going on internationally. So they'll go out of their way to do research themselves and really get an understanding of not only why we invaded various countries or what we're about to do and whether or not it's a good idea, they try to look into the influences behind the decisions that are made by our politicians. So when you understand the legalized bribery that's really ingrained and enmeshed in our politics today, then you see why some of these decisions are made. I mean, I think that's the reason why a lot of our democratic politicians will kind of just drop it when it comes to certain poli uh, foreign policy issues. I mean, it, this year alone, we're not even done with 2019. And I don't know, maybe I'm gonna get in trouble mentioning this at a conference like this, but Raytheon alone has contributed $2 million in lobbying. Now, they're not doing that out of the kindness of their hearts. There's, there's a message behind that, you know? There is a message behind that. Their whole, you know, business survives and thrives based on whether or not we're going to use their products or use them as contractors in wars. So when there's this entire military industrial complex built, and I know that that's a cliche at this point, unfortunately that does influence the decisions that our pol uh, politicians make. And I think that now more than ever, with this democratized uh, flow of information, Americans are aware of it, and that's why they, they do their research and they look into these candidates to see whether or not they have been corrupted by these interests. Let me let's dig into that a little bit more, uh, because I, I hear what you're saying, but I, much to Bob's earlier point, I'm skeptical that many people have the time or the bandwidth to, you know, <laughs> dig in and check the sourcing and go through all the rigmarole and, and digging up their information on Yemen, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of <laughs> these narratives are not generated in a vacuum, right? They're, they're, there's a whole host of things that drive what ends up getting attention, what doesn't get attention. Um, and there's sort of a, a campaign that is happening on the margins of every presidential or Senate campaign. Um, working in the media, being very familiar with this space, um, what are those forces? Like, what does this look like? And, and I know that, you know, there's this sort of uh, military industrial complex that we talk about, uh, but it'd be interesting to kind of get a little deeper into what that looks like in mm -hmm. practice. Yeah, I mean, look, it really, it really depends, and you don't know what would spark uh, a particular conversation. But what I've noticed, at least over the last few years, is, again, I'm going to keep re reiterating, people want to know where their resources are going. And so when they look at the amount of, uh, you know, U.S. taxpayer money that goes toward defense, they want to know why. And why do we keep increasing money for defense, but we keep decreasing funding for, you know, maybe government programs that people need, uh, education, stuff that actually benefits the people living in this country, right? At the same token, you know, the issue of the VA came up quite a bit in 2016. And I think that's super relevant because we really underestimate how many Americans have undergone multiple deployments in these terrible wars and they're suffering from mental health conditions as a result or physical injuries that they'll never recover from as a result. And those numbers keep growing. And so on one hand, our soldiers are sent to these wars. They're not really paid well. I mean, when you really look at the numbers, we keep increasing the defense budget, but the salaries for our soldiers remain insanely low. I mean, it's pathetic. And then after their deployment's over, they come here and they're not given the health care that they need. They're not given the treatment and the respect that they need. And so a lot of the propaganda that we've seen in the media in the lead up to these wars, this whole notion of supporting the troops, people aren't buying it anymore. So I think that the topic of the VA was incredibly important because it was really about a domestic policy. Are we funding the VA enough? Do we need to privatize it? Does it make sense for it to be controlled by the government? I mean, that was a domestic debate, 
But really, it's something that has a lot to do with our foreign policy decisions, you know, and, and where our resources are going. So it really depends on, you know, the topics that rise to the top during elections. But one thing I also want to note is we're 13 months out and you have no idea what's going to come up next. I think you're absolutely right that now with this impeachment inquiry, it's likely that we're going to focus a lot more on Ukraine and why it is that, you know, I'm seeing a lot of discussion about why it is that we need to provide foreign aid. I, I don't necessarily agree with those who think it doesn't make sense to provide foreign aid, uh, military aid to Ukraine. But people are now questioning where the resources are going and whether or not it even makes sense to contribute to another country in the form of foreign aid. So you just don't know where it's going to go. And honestly, with this election cycle, I think that Donald Trump's behavior is going to drive much of the debate and the conversation. I think that's true. And I actually agree with you about skewed priorities in this country and that we ought to be investing more money in uh, a lot of things like early childhood education that's just neglected. Uh, but where I disagree is, first, I think the Internet, I, I don't have as rosy a picture of the Internet and what's happened with social media as you do. Uh, I think it has democratized politics to some extent. I think it's also debased politics. Uh, if in 1962... Someone had gone to, and that we lived in a world where there were two and a half networks and the New York Times and pretty soon the Washington Post, and they drove all the coverage. Uh, someone had gone to Walter Cronkite at CBS and said, there's a group called the John Birch Society, and they're going to have a press conference today where they're going to say that President Eisenhower, they're going to offer this argument and some proof that President Eisenhower is an unwitting agent of the communist conspiracy, and President Kennedy is an untrammeled socialist, uh, how many camera crews do you want to send? Cronkite would have looked up and said, you're fired. Uh, today, because of the multiplication of sources through social media, almost any story can get out there. I mean, that ridiculous story about Elizabeth Warren yesterday, uh, to which I think she gave the greatest answer I've ever seen by putting up, she went to the University of Houston, and they're called the Houston Cougars, <laughs> so she put that on the Internet. Uh, but almost any of that stuff can get out there. But I don't believe and this is where I would agree with Tom, I don't believe most people have the time to sort through all of this. I think a lot of people in your audience maybe sort through it. Uh, <laughs> and that's why voters <coughs> tend to narrow their focus. Finally, yes, money is a very corrupting influence in American politics. Citizens United was a disaster. At some point, it has to be dealt with. I think most likely will be dealt with if we ever get a different Supreme Court, uh, because this Supreme Court is at least doing one useful thing, which is showing that if you have a bad precedent or what they think is a bad precedent, you just get rid of it. Uh, and they took a case on abortion today, which seems com squarely on point with the decision they already made in 2016. What are they going to do? Reverse the decision from 2016 just in time for the 2020 election? Actually, it will hurt Trump if they do it. Uh, so, but I don't think the money is as directly transactional mm -hmm. as you suggest. I think it, it maybe goes the other way around, which is you have a lot of people who believe in, say, the Paul Ryan philosophy of government, and then you have the Koch brothers who pour a lot of money into the campaigns of those people. Do they profit from those policies? Yes. Do I think that they went to those people and said, you know, we'll support you if you'll do A, B, and C? And I don't think that's the way it works most of the time. I think these were convinced Randian conservatives, which is what Paul Ryan is. Uh, and <coughs> I happen to think he's wrong, but I don't think it is purely transactional and it's, it's corrupt at a much deeper level than that. So I want to make sure that we have time for um, the audience to ask some questions here. Um, we have a microphone that will float around, so um, if you have a question, please raise your hand. I'm already seeing a few. Um, and we'll go from there. Thanks very much. Um, if you were the senior media advisor to Joe Biden today, what would you tell him strategically to do on dealing with questions about the Ukraine? Because there's one theory that helps him, keeps him in the center. There's another theory that doesn't help him at all. I would embrace it. Because, you look, sometimes strategy in campaigns is necessity. I mean, 
he's, he's going to be stuck with this issue one way or another. So we ought to embrace it and really go after Trump on it and talk about it. Uh, otherwise, it's going to be out there and people are going to say, well, you know, maybe it's not true, but the stuff about Hillary wasn't true, but he managed to use it to help beat Hillary. And, you know, she was never very robust in fighting back on that stuff. I think if I were advising him, I would say you got to be really robust in this. You really got to go after him. Well, one piece of advice I would give him is please don't tell your senior aides to speak to cable news networks and urge them to not allow Giuliani on air. That is, uh, that is something that actually happened. Just based on principle alone, um, I don't think that anyone in government or any politician should tell anyone in the media what they can and can't do. But aside from that, please keep talking, Giuliani. It's been wonderful. <laughs> it's been great. And I think that I think this is going to hurt Biden to some extent. So I understand the urge to, you know, just quiet down any of the accusations that we're hearing from the Trump administration. But at the same time, I think that it's it makes a lot of sense to allow lunatics to keep talking. It's not going away. So yeah. he's got to have to deal with it. Thank you so much. Um, I am a former foreign service officer, so seeing things from the perspective of a practitioner of foreign policy, um, and wanted to sort of ask you a question, but first give an observation and ask you about it. Uh, in, in the actual practice of foreign policy, a lot of the sort of partisan politics is just not really relevant. Um, and I think that as much as practitioners of foreign policy say we wish the, you know, society would be more engaged and more more attentive to foreign policy issues. There's actually, a, you know, like a benefit as a practitioner that this has not become a partisan issue in the past, that you could sort of practice a foreign policy where 80% of the practitioners agreed on about 80% of foreign policy. And yes, there were debates in the margins and things changed a little from administ administration to administration, but there was stability, there was a continuity. And I have a feeling that a lot of current practitioners of foreign policy think that we're sort of in this fevered moment where America is not, it has strayed from a bipartisan consensus where, you know, before we would tell countries, we're going to take our share of refugees, you do the same, treat them decently, it's our obligation, we have a rules-based international order, we have to defend it, our NATO allies are important to us, our East Asian allies are important to us. It is sort of generalized consensus. And I feel like a lot of current practitioners think the fever is going to break and we'll just go back and everyone will say, okay, are you normal again, America? Can we trust that we'll just go back to the way things were? And I don't know that that's the case. I think that we will have lost a lot of credibility. We can't just go back and say, okay, we're going to go back to the stuff we were doing four years ago. As people who are involved on the political side, I want to know what your take on this is. Do you think that politics has essentially broken the bipartisan consensus on foreign policy? That's a great question and, and really great insight. So thank you for sharing. I, I think that I think that you're absolutely right in that what's being done now, um, it's not going to change as soon as you get a new president in office. Uh, okay, so we've been focusing a lot, of mil a lot on military intervention. Let's focus on trade, for instance. I think that's a really great example of how once you get a new president, I mean, these trade deals that are now being forged by Longtime enemies, it's kind of incredible. So you have countries that had never done trade with one another before, and now they're engaging in these trade deals, and they're not just going to drop those deals as soon as you get another president. So I think that that's um, an example. I mean, just this week, uh, tr Donald Trump had a joint press conference with the president of Finland, and that was yet another example of us really losing credibility on the world stage uh, because he unfortunately used that joint press conference to air his grievances about how he feels that he's being targeted too much by this impeachment investigation. But I will say that I don't think that there should be so much of a consensus when it comes to the two parties, when it comes to foreign policy. And the reason why I say that is because disagreement is a good thing. Now, disagreement in the way that we're seeing it today, where it's tribal and it's not productive and no one's really interested in hearing one another out, that's not a good thing. But I would like to hear conflicting 
points of view when it comes to military intervention or these trade deals or whether or not it makes sense to provide foreign aid or weapons to various countries. I think there's been a little too much consensus throughout various decades. I mean, the lead up to the war in Iraq is a perfect example of that. If anyone spoke out against it, they would, you know, be criticized quite a bit um, in the media. Their careers would be on the line. And I'm talking about both politicians and people in the media. So I think that uh, disagreement can be productive. I want to see a little more of, you know, a challenge to conventional wisdom when it comes to foreign policy. It just needs to be a little more productive than what we're seeing today. Uh, first of all, I, certain parts of the consensus I would like to see back and I would, you know, something like refugees, or how we deal with those kind of humanitarian crises, how we deal with international economic stability. I mean, we can't do it without cooperating. Uh, and that's what Trump has walked away from. I mean, the consensus in favor of NATO, I think, has served the U.S. very, very well since 1948 and served the Western world very well. So I'd like to see us return to that. I think something really profound went on. Uh, which is that globalization took off. It was probably inevitable. It's had a lot of benefits in some ways. Uh, and, but it had losers. And it had a lot of people who were left behind or saw their incomes shrink, saw their standards of lives dec living decline. Uh, and nobody paid much attention to it. And nobody made the positive case for globalization, combining it with a program or a set of programs that could have helped those folks who, say, in western Pennsylvania, where I was born, the town I was born is basically half a ghost town, uh, but that would have helped those folks. I do believe that a new president who wanted to, to, to address this, and I don't think you could do this in a campaign as a candidate. I think you have to do it as a president that has the attention of the country. And you have to combine both argument and policy. You have to have both legs of, of the stool there. You can't have a two-legged stool. You've got to have both legs. Uh, you've got to have both aspects uh, to make any progress. And I, I do wonder whether the, the issue you raise is why the, these are often less potent political issues because of that consensus historically, right? You know, we're having a lot of conversation right now about China and specifically China trade issues, and the message, you know, I'm going to be tough on China too, just differently, um, is often difficult to massage in a way that is potent, right? Um, but I think I'm, I tend to be an optimist in the sense that, like, four years of this current political space um, is, is manageable, potentially, but what concerns me is that once you get to... Um, much beyond that, you have a whole generation of world leaders where this is the only United States they've ever known. You know, the president of the United States is the only president they've ever worked with, and this, the relationships they currently have are the only relationships they've ever had. Um, and the longer that happens and the more of those people you have out in that space, the harder it is to come back. Yeah. go on that side. You can use it if you like. Um, so we were talking about foreign aid earlier. I want to try and understand why we do foreign aid, and here's sort of my logic. So obviously we have interests abroad, and we have allies. We want to support all the allies, but there's so many interests and so many allies, and there's only so much money we can spend, right? So we're obviously going to do what we can, but then we're still not able to do all that we can, and we're going to drain the economies. Thank you. Um, so where do we draw the line with respect to foreign aid? Well, foreign aid doesn't drain a huge amount of money away from the U.S. compared to the size of our gross domestic product. And I think you've got to draw a distinction between military aid, which is actually often not aid, it's sales. Uh, and the Saudis will buy a lot of American weapons, for example. And uh, development aid and humanitarian aid. Uh, I think if the United States, I think it's a moral issue to begin with, by the way, uh, and that's why the UN Millennium Development Goals were so important and we're so far from reaching them. Uh, and we have, you know, hundreds of millions of kids who don't go to school or uh, at all in the world. 
And that, by the way, is a recipe long term. That's a national security disaster to, to leave folks like that without any hope at all. Uh, so I, I, I would strongly defend foreign aid. I think it goes back all the way to the Cold War, where it was used as a Cold War weapon. But then post-Cold War, it was increasingly being used, uh, but not in this administration, uh, to try to strengthen countries economically and give them some hope. If you don't do it, by the way, China is going to go out and buy Africa. They're just going to own Africa. Uh, they'll do projects there. They'll bribe people and all of that. But really? You, I mean, it doesn't take that much of our GDP. And there are people starving in this world. And we have the resources to help them. There are kids. I mean, Bill Gates is, is doing the, 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 his, his challenge in terms of global health. I mean, people are dying of preventable diseases. And George W. Bush, who I disagreed with profoundly on almost everything, did an amazing job in terms of AIDS in Africa. And probably a lot of people are alive today who would not have been alive if he hadn't done that. So I, I think foreign aid is really critical. I think re-examining some of the military aid that we give is makes sense. And I, I, I disagree with our policy with respect to Saudi Arabia. Uh, but on the other hand, I, I would sell weapons to South Korea. I mean, they need them. So putting, you know, the moral argument aside, and I think it's a legitimate argument, um, there are situations in which foreign aid, and I think this is usually done in the vast majority of, of decisions, um, it benefits us. You know, I have more of a realist view on the decisions that our politicians make because, yes, there's the moral equivalent, there's the moral uh, component and people want to do the right thing, but there's also, let's say, foreign aid to Central American countries that Donald Trump cut, by the way. That foreign aid's important because if you're concerned about a migrant crisis at our border, well, instead of dealing with the symptom, which is the migrant crisis, what can we do to help build these Central American countries and empower them so the situation isn't so terrible in those countries where people need to flee the violence? So those are cases where I think foreign policy makes all the sense in the world. And, you know, there needs to be proper oversight because a lot of these countries are dealing with their own corrupt issues. Um, but if you do it right, I think that the resources make sense in those situations. But I, I, I do agree with you. I do think that there are... Um, there are situations in which you have to think about the moral component, and you also have to think about your allies, because you need your allies in case there are issues with adversaries in the future. You know, it's, I think of foreign policy kind of like high school drama. You know, people like to gather in their groups or their cliques, and it's done as a way of, it's a defense mechanism. And so you see that on an international stage as well. So uh, foreign aid... Uh uh, constitutes approximately 1% of the federal budget. I just looked it up. Uh, Sweden spends 1.41% of its GDP on foreign aid. They're not uh, spending enough. <laughs> I'm just uh, right. We hear that all the time. <laughs> Way ahead of us. I, 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 the problem with military, I can look it up, but the problem with military aid is it's, and, and Anna alluded to this earlier, we're not giving the weapons to Saudi Arabia. We're selling the weapons to Saudi Arabia, or Raytheon, or somebody else is selling the weapons to, to Saudi Arabia. Uh, <coughs> the military aid that we give is, I think, far less significant than, than, than the military sales. But, but the non-military foreign aid, is, it's a very small portion of our GDP in our federal budget. <laughs> I, this is for you, Anna. I'm curious because um, I think a lot like you do that that people are paying attention more. And then I go into the eastern shore of Virginia or Maryland or even in downtown L.A. and talk among the clerks in the courtrooms, and I realize that people are not paying attention. And I'm try I would like to know your thoughts about how to make... Foreign, Trump appeals, it's like fast food, right? He mm -hmm. makes these bold statements. They may not be true. In fact, most of the time they're not true. But 
it's fast food, and that is being, that's what's digested. On the eastern shore, when I'm talking to farmers, soybean farmers, who are losing everything, they are, they're not paying attention at all. They can, their children and their wives, and they can actually tell me in birth order the Kardashian sisters mm -hmm. and who they're married to and the baby daddies, but they, can, they did not know when I was telling a story about Sonia Sotomayor, who that even was. So what do we do to get that fast food digestible <laughs> nugget out to the people who are actually working every day and struggling and don't have the time like we do to do this? It's a great question. Well, I think that what, so I can only speak from a media perspective. And, and I think that it's important to focus on what unifies and, and concerns most voters. And again, I'm going to go back to that economic issue. So the appeal of Donald Trump was he kept talking about things that voters felt were, were neglected for a long time, particularly the corruption, even though he's corrupt, uh, uh, the economic situation reality for most Americans, and these forever wars. Like, he kept driving those points home. And it's no surprise that there were Democrats that were willing to flip and, and vote for him because they're like, oh, well, I mean, he's a little bit of a wild card, but he's talking about the issues that have been neglected for so long. So I think that it's important for the media to understand that Donald Trump's tweets don't matter. They matter to some extent, but that is not the heart of the story. That is not the news. That is not what we, sh we should be hyper-focused on. We should be ho focused on going to these you know, states where, where farmers are suffering, having conversations with them. You know, for all the grief that CNN's been getting, I do have to give them credit for the focus groups that they've done that, you know, you know mostly focus on uh, Trump supporters and how they're feeling right now. But they've done wonderful series where they've talked to these soybean farmers. And in the very beginning, you know, when the trade war started and they were already starting to see the negative effects of Trump's policies, they were like, I don't know, I'm going to stick to him. I, I, I think that he's going to really fight for us and get things done. But as that series goes on, and as you see more and more of these focus groups, the situation becomes more and more dire. And I think that they are paying attention. So I would like to see more polling on that, because right now we're basing a lot of our thoughts on anecdotal evidence. But the media overall, I think, is failing voters in focusing on that fast food. Because Trump has every intention to make sure this news cycle moves ahead as quickly as possible. And so he'll distract us with his nonsense on social media. But that's not really what people care about. It might be entertaining, but it's not the uh, substantive content that I think most Americans crave. Uh, let me be optimistic about this. Uh, Trump engaged in a fast food orgy headed into the 2018 midterms. Uh, they were all about the caravan is coming, the rapists are coming, the criminals are hidden inside the gangs, uh, all of that. And did it impact people? Yeah. Uh, folks turned out in record numbers for a midterm election, including young people, and Democrats won a much bigger victory than people had anticipated by nearly 9% in the popular vote took back the House, and he actually had an impact on uh, attitudes toward immigration. If you had polled before he started doing this, you know, they're, they're pretty, pretty tolerant on immigration. Was it good or bad? You were 57% good, you know, 38% bad. Afterwards, like 65% good, and much lower percent saying that immigrants were bad for the country. So... Yeah, his fast food gets a lot of attention. And uh, I do think we have to say, by the way, in terms of, of, of his, the fact that he's sitting in the Oval Office, had it not been for James Comey, he would not be sitting in the Oval Office, in my view. And had the Hillary Clinton campaign bothered to run some economic ads in the Rust Belt, uh, he would not be sitting in the Oval Office. Uh, so we have to understand that. So I, I'm not, I, I know Democrats are, you know, Put your heads down. It's going to rain. It's all going to be bad. Trump has magic. I don't think he has magic. They need to learn to fight. I think that's the biggest issue. I think that, you know, cowering or, or we're in a different time. They can't react the way that they've traditionally reacted to political issues. I think that they need to fight. And 
I've used this phrase in media appearances and people think that it's unacceptable, but it's true. They need to make their opponents bend to their will. They need to fight. That's the biggest issue right now. I think Barack Obama, by the way, was a pretty good fighter. Uh, we have time for one more question. Um, so I guess Rich's question is, to what extent do you think um, the news press, the news media, is responsible in shaping foreign policy? I don't know what percentage of responsibility I would give them, but I think that it's important. I think the way the media handles foreign policy is important. The way that they report on various issues uh, matters. So I'll give you an example. Venezuela, the coverage of Venezuela, I think was very lopsided. And luckily, you know, things didn't escalate to the point where we actually invaded yet another country. But the there were doctored videos that were aired as you know factual events that happened and uh i think that that shapes minds it, it, i mean the fear mongering you hear toward various leaders i think that the media does matter in the lead up to the war in iraq i'm going to just really reiterate dissenting voices were not allowed in fact cable news hosts that questioned you know engaging in this preemptive war were taken off the air I, and so it does matter. It really does matter um, that media, the journalists do their jobs and really do put, everyone has biases, but you have to put your bias aside in search of the truth. What's really going on? What was the war in, you know, in Syria? I don't think that most Americans really have a good grasp of the fact that that war was way more complicated. I don't think most Americans know that it was a proxy war and you have Iran involved, you have Russia involved. You know, so... The media, I think, focuses on what gets the clicks now with digital media. They focus on what gets eyeballs on television. There's a lot of garbage out there that, unfortunately, people are attracted to because people love drama. But sometimes you got to, like, you know, sneak in the vegetables along with the dessert. Because otherwise, you're going to have... I do agree, when it comes to foreign policy, there are some issues where Americans are uninformed. And you can't blame the electorate for that. you got to blame the media for that. By the way, Barack Obama got nominated for president in 2008 because he'd spoken out against the Iraq war before it started. Uh, and my own experience was that I appeared during that period uh, fairly frequently on cable television, and I was highly critical of the Iraq war. Uh, I do think that the news institution that had the biggest problem with, with the coverage leading into Iraq was, believe it or not, an institution I really care about, the New York Times. Uh, and, you know, some of these stories that got printed about aluminum tubes and mud for whatever the hell that thing was called, red earth or mud from yellow, yellow cake. cake from Niger was nuts. And the fact that it ever got by an editor was appalling. Uh, and the, there was just a, but I do think you have to understand it was the post 9 11 psychology, too. I mean, people were traumatized. And this yeah. didn't happen in America where somebody could do this to us. I mean, people even forgot there was a World Trade Center attack in 93. I mean, but the closest something had ever come to this kind of scale was Pearl Harbor. But that's out there in the middle of the Pacific. And as Donald Trump uh, has several times implied, they're probably not even part of the United States. But for this to happen in New York was very traumatizing for people. And I think that helped condition the media's uh, coverage of that. I'm afraid that's all the time we have today. Um, Anna, Bob, thank you so much for coming out and joining us. And thank you all for turning out.